All right. Good singing this morning. I want to talk about a couple things. And uh, not all, every time the preacher gets up, uh, it's not always to preach. It's kind of like that. Whenever dad gets up, it's not always to preach at you. Sometimes it's just to talk about things. You know, sometimes we talk about things uh, with our, uh, and I don't say this in a condescending way, but just as an example, sometimes we sit down and we talk about things before they're a problem uh, so that they don't become a problem. And uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned, how many of you were able to see um, Thursday night? How many of you were able to see Thursday night's uh, message on hope? If you haven't had an opportunity, uh, I would encourage you to see that. And uh, if you have any troubles getting a hold of that, let me know. But um, one of the things that I mentioned that I was going to address is the church building. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to talk to the studs and the walls, etc. But uh, a, limit, a legitimate question. Uh, let me ask you a question. Let's try to get, because I, I can understand where this question might come out of. And this is kind of teaching. It's kind of talking over. So it's okay to talk back. I mean, it's not okay to talk back, but you know what I'm saying. It's okay to talk and ask questions. But a uh, question might, might, has come uh, up in conversations out there uh, with different people is, uh, in the New Testament, do we ever necessarily hear about a church building? Ever hear about a church building in the New Testament? Um, and, and so as, I, as I, I look to the New Testament for the answer, because we can't look to tradition, we can't look to... Uh, you know, what we do nowadays necessarily. The answer is, uh, while Christians met in churches in the first century, not everybody had a church, built. not every church had a church building necessarily. Uh, you can imagine the scene in Jerusalem, how on three, on one occasion, 3,000 people got saved. Now, let me ask you a question. In Cleelum, if 3,000 people got saved Right away, is there a building that could house 3,000, that you could just, everybody could gather 3,000 people? What if we did a Sunday morning and a Sunday afternoon and a Sunday evening church? Uh, is, there mer- is there even really, there's probably only one building that could fit 1,000 people and you'd be really cramming it in. It'd be kind of hard. We'd probably all fit them into the school. And so the question, I think is a good question. It's, you know, our, it, it, it's kind of a lot of questions. Our churches. Uh, are church buildings, if you will, uh, okay to have? Uh, why do we have a church building? Did Christians in the first century have a church building? Uh, are they viable today? And we could spend a lot of time. I could spend a whole message in just that. But I, I just want to read you something very short. It won't take very much of our time. And I believe it was a good. Uh, I believe it's a good article that would help us to be able to understand this from a, a seasoned pastor. His name is John uh, Piper. And he says this, and, uh, and, and this is from quite a while ago, this is uh, that he wrote this. He says, first, the church in the New Testament, as the New Testament teaches about the church, is people, not places. The word church in the New Testament is a translation of the word ecclesia that means called out ones or assembly. It never refers to a building or a place. The English word church is an interesting word. Where did it come from? It came from the English kirk or kirke in the Scottish, uh, like in the Scottish kirch. It comes from uh, the Greek word kirkuros, which means belonging to the Lord. So the word church means belonging to the Lord. And so uh, where do we get the word church? It means it, it was, it's from that English word belonging to the Lord. And that is the, and, and it, over time, and I'm going to spend, I'm not going to read all the article, but over time, that word church in the English and in the Scottish and in other languages came to refer to the people that gathered together, they belong to the Lord, or the building that they gather in, it belongs to the Lord, or it could be talking about the people gathering in the building, the people belonging to the Lord and the building belonging to the Lord. That's where our English word church, which is what we translate that word assembly from the New Testament in the Greek from. But in this whole discussion, it is utterly crucial to keep in mind that in the New Testament, nothing is said about the church's place and much is said about the church as people. 
You ju just to give a few examples, Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was not a building he is talking about. Or in Matthew 18, 17, in church discipline, he says, uh, when all, uh, when he's explaining that when all private uh, uh, dealings have failed, tell it to the church. Does that mean we're supposed to talk to the bricks? Uh, no, we understand that's not the case. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. Um, had peace uh, in Acts chapter 30, 13 and verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets, certain prophets and teachers, meaning among the people there were some uh, with these gifts. So, Pastor John says, uh, this is my first observation, the church in the New Testament is always, without exception, people, not places. My second observation is that the New Testament portrays local churches, that is, local assemblies, gatherings of the family of God in a local place, and the expression of the family of God gathers in a local place. It portrays these churches often as gathering in homes. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, the churches of Asia send greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house. Uh, Colossians 4, 15, give my, uh, the, they were supposed to greet the brethren uh, in, in Laodicea and the church in her house there in Philemon chapter 2. And uh, we could go on and on. Don't over, uh, third observation, don't overstate or idealize the fact because we know that houses were not the only venue for churches to gather. And so 1 Corinthians, if you turn there with me, uh, I want you to understand not all gatherings of the church were in homes. Uh, not all gatherings of the church were necessarily in a church building. And contrary how some would teach, uh, some would teach this, well, while the church gathered uh, certain places, it was only the temple that God sanctioned them. And uh, there's a lot of false teaching going on concerning uh, the gathering of the church. And again, um, we find it here in First in First Corinthians. Uh, sorry, chap if I, I'm sorry if I said Second Corinthians. First Corinthians, chapter number eleven, very familiar to us, as we are uh, just shortly, not too long ago, observed the Lord's table. And in verse number seventeen, he says, "Now." In this I declare, uh, I, I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. And then we could spend a lot of time explaining. He's explaining the Lord's specifically coming together uh, and, the, and the Lord's table and how they had gotten things kind of out of proportion. They get, had gotten things wrong. In verse number 20, the Bible says, When you come together, therefore, into one place, it is not to meet it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You say, now what is this place? I want to be real honest. We don't know what this place is, but we might have indication of what this place is not. It says, for in eating and drinking, everyone taketh uh, before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Notice the question, verse number 22. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? That what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And so what did he say there? What he's saying is, you have churches to eat in. Now, does that mean that we're never supposed to eat? Sorry, houses. You have houses. Very good. To, uh, to eat in. Does that mean we're never supposed to eat as a church when we gather together? No. But every time we come together is not necessarily an occasion in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to partake in the Lord's table. You say, why don't we have the Lord's table every single week? Well, because we don't have the Lord's table every time we meet together for one, and, uh, and we eat at our houses. Our main nutrition is, at, uh, is in our own private residences. Now, again, there's no, there's no, we see that the Bible tells us, gives us example in Acts, how they met publicly and from house to house, and they continued in, uh, in uh, prayers and in, uh, um, help me out. They, they continued in, and among the things that they continued in was breaking of bread. And what does that mean? They, they ate together. So there's nothing wrong with eating together. There's nothing wrong with assembling in the church. We got example after example, uh, but not all eating is done in the church and not all assembling is done in 
a home. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 17 and 22, Paul uh, addresses this. And so in other words, he's saying, uh, are you getting together? In other words, he's saying that people are getting together in a place other than their home. And uh, so verse number four, uh, nowhere, or sorry, thought number four, nowhere in the New Testament is it commanded or forbidden that the local church meet in homes. It's perfectly acceptable that they do and perfectly acceptable that they don't. This is not something God thought it wise to regulate. God is silent. He, ne he gave us commandments. He said, as oft as ye eat. He said, this do in remembrance of me. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Over and over and over throughout the New Testament, we are given commands and principles and precepts about things that we're supposed to do. But you know what he didn't command us specifically about? He never commanded us specifically or even in general or gave us general guidance that we had to meet in a house. You say, why is that important, Pastor Steve? Because there are some people that purport that if you are meeting in a church building, that, that a church building is outside of, the, uh, it's outside of the plan of God. And that a church building is not a biblical uh, principle or it's not uh, a biblical allowance. I would say facetiously, uh, neither is a computer or an automobile or a lot of other things that we use in this day and this age. And uh, I love how uh, Pastor John put this. Nowhere in the New Testament is it commanded or forbidden that the local church meet in homes. It is perfectly acceptable that they do and acceptable that they don't. This is not something that God thought it wise to regulate. No doubt, I believe, in part because of the incredibly diverse cultural situations churches would find themselves in for the next 2,000 years under trees, in garages, in stores, in cellars, in caves, in cathedrals, in homes. What did God do? God gave us liberty to be able to meet as his people in a number of venues. Therefore, in all those differing cultural situations, leaders of the church should seriously think through and pray through the relative advantages and disadvantages of place and location given the nature and goals of the church whether they should limit their gatherings to homes or rent a space or purchase space or build a building. And we should be really slow to judge the decisions that are made here since God, it seems to me, has been pleased to bring great awakenings and massive church growth during times with and without buildings. He is not limited in that way and woe to the denomination or movement that presumes to say architecture, buildings, location, is the key to the dynamic of the almighty spread of God's kingdom. Final thought is that whether the limitations are culturally, it is pretty hard to get a space in downtown San Francisco, Vancouver, Manhattan, because you have to pay a million dollars for a tiny little piece of land. And of course, I just read this morning as I was praying through Operation World that in Libya, there's a law that provides any religious gathering over six people. Well, in that pretty limit, that is pretty limiting, and you don't have to obey uh, the law since it's not biblical, but you might want to obey it and spread the gospel in that way. Think about if you had to limit your meeting to six people. Now, obviously, we would probably meet like Christians did underground, uh, but the idea there, uh, you know, God could still work in that framework. Think if only six people could meet together, and then they found six other people they could share the gospel with etc. I'm not advocating it, I'm just mention it. So whatever the limitations are culturally, financially, legally, it is wonderful and fitting and helpful thing when local churches can find both small expressions of fellowship and mutual ministry, um, one another ministry and larger gatherings for worship and encouragement and witness. And I think it is significant that Acts chapter 5 verse 42, uh, set, and, and we'll be there, Acts chapter 5, and verse number 42, the Bible says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus. And so as a pastor, I want to admonish you. If somebody asks you concerning a church building, our church buildings uh, sanctioned by the New Testament, I believe that the church is encouraged to meet 
uh, all over. The church is encouraged to meet corporately if they have a building, if they have no building. Uh, lack of a building doesn't mean that churches just don't meet. And having a building, uh, being ordered out of your building, um, being persecuted uh, in, in different times, Christians found ways uh, of meeting. And a, 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 I, love, I love this. Wouldn't it be neat if uh, the building of great, the, the building that we have here, if people got saved and it happened in such a way that this building couldn't hold the, the people of Grace Baptist Church that were saved. And so we had to meet at a rented gym or we had to re meet at a senior center or we had to meet out in the open or we had to break up our meeting because we couldn't all fit into one place in an orderly fashion. I think, praise the Lord, if something like that were to happen, but as long as we have a building to meet in, it keeps us uh, sheltered from the uh, from the elements. Um, and we're going to keep it to the uh, best of our ability that God has given us. And uh, any questions? I know that's the it's the scariest thing a pastor can ever say. Any questions? Any questions or any thoughts? Okay. Romans chapter number 12 and uh we had we had hit romans chapter 13 we had backed up to romans chapter number 12. Uh, we got running with uh several different things we're going to review a little bit and then we want to get right in uh to romans chapter number 12. and uh we had talked about last week how that god gives gifts to his people in the setting uh, of the church we talked about how uh, in the family of God, there's many members, but there's one body and all the members have different uh, individual functions. They have differing gifts and they're according to the grace that God has given us. Again, it's, it's, not our, it's his choice and not our choice that spiritual gifts are given at the discretion of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 11, but all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will and what does that mean so that means each one of us has different things that god has gifted us with and uh and and some of these things can seem physical some of these things can seem like they're not very spiritual uh some some people i know they have uh, the gift of being able to put things in order now i can do that if i take a little bit of time and i take a little bit of uh uh ingenuity I can get some things in order, but some people, they can just, like, it's like a gift. And God uses that in the setting of the church. Some people have that gift of mercy. Now, all of us are called to be merciful, but some people, it just, it comes out of them. Mercy just seems to, if I could say it like this, it just flows uh, out of their person. Like they do it without, it seems like they do it without any kind of effort. And God has worked through the situations of their lives to allow them to be able to be like that. We looked at some main points. We looked at prophecy or the forth telling of the word of God. We looked at edification and exhortation and ministering, literally meeting uh, the needs of people, the gift of teaching and exhortation and the gift of giving and the gift of uh, ruling or uh, leadership, the gift of mercy. But now we're finding ourselves as we're in Romans chapter number 12, and, uh, and we're going to pick it up in uh, verse number nine. It talks about all these different gifts, these different, if you will, talents or abilities that God bakes into his people through the experiences, through the gifting of his uh, spirit, through the things that, that he does to allow them to be able to be in our lives, these gifts. But then he gives us, if you will, what I call some tempering measures. Say, so what does that mean? That means taking the power that God has given to us and refining it a little bit. How many of you have ever seen an explosion? A lot of power in an explosion. Uh, was watching one of these police cars that they uh, started on fire over in Chicago and how that it just started burning, 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 and then boom, exploded. Now uh, you say, what, what do you, why are we talking about explosions? Why are we talking about power? Understand the same potential, instead of being destructive, is used in a very different way inside the engine of a car. Do you know what makes a car move? It's tiny little explosions. Bang, 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 bang. Controlled and harnessed 
etc. Well, God, he's given these gifts. He's given the gift of uh, ruling. He's given the gift of teaching, the gift of prophecy, uh, the gift of exhortation, the gift of mercy. But he's given us a way as a church to be able to live our lives in such a way that mercy doesn't become winking at sin and preaching doesn't become uh, ranting and raving and exhortation doesn't become nagging and, and understand what can happen is if we're not careful, the gifts that God has given us can be used in the wrong way. And so right after that, he tells that right after the section on explaining the gifts and the context of, uh, of, of the body here, he begins to talk about a couple different things. And so follow along verse number nine, the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. So we went there, started with verse number nine, went through verse number 13 and say, well, doesn't Paul continue to go on? Well, I want to stop for a moment. And as a church, I want us to consider that from verse number nine to verse number 13, God is telling us specifically how we ought to deal with people inside that family of God, inside that, uh, if you will, the supplies, uh, I believe very broadly also to the, the setting of the local congregation He's telling us how we as Christians are supposed to act toward us as Christians. You know, if we're not careful, you know, in uh, the, the common experience that, uh, and, and this is an illustration, but I think uh, it also carries on uh, into, into the church life. But you ever noticed how when people are first in a relationship, it's exciting, it's uh, it's fl there's flares and sparks, you know. You we've all known young people that met somebody, and when they met somebody, there was a lot of love or excitement or attention. And as they become to know each other, that love and excitement and it and attention grew into routine. It grew into, if you will, wasn't as exciting as it was at the beginning. Well, understand. When you first get saved or you first join a local congregation, a church, sometimes it can be really exciting. You're learning new things that you never knew before. You're getting to start to do certain things that you've never done before. God is starting to work in your life. But if we're not careful as Christians, we can, if we could say it like this, we can lose our spark in the setting of God's congregation, in the setting of the family of God, that we had at the beginning. And I believe that Romans chapter number 12 gives us some pretty exciting ways that we can keep that spark alive and that we can temper the gifts that God has given us. Notice it said there in verse number nine, let love be without dissimulation. In James chapter number uh, three and verse 17, we're given this. The Bible says the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, uh, full of mercy and good fruits without uh, partiality, without hypocrisy. You say, what is dissimulation? Let love be without dissimulation. Well, when we read about James, about uh, wisdom, and how the wisdom that comes from God is peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality. And then at the very end, it says, without hypocrisy. Now, let's, let's call on one of our little people. Um, Deborah, what is a hypocrite? Mm. Somebody who thinks he's better than he is? Looking for a better answer than that. Stephen, what's a hypocrite? Exactly. Somebody who tells somebody, either it's either this way, somebody who tells somebody to do something or somebody, and, and they won't do what they tell other people to do, <coughs> or somebody who tells people not to do something, but they do it themselves. Like the brother who tells his brother, don't use your sleeve 
to wipe. Don't you lose, use your sleeve to wipe your mouth. What would we call that? That's being a hypocrite. You're wiping or uh, remember to shut the front door and then you forget to shut the front door. Hypocrisy, dissimulation. So we, we're getting the idea of uh, dissimulation and uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it's kind of those couple different words rolled together. Without hypocrisy, another word we could say is uh, without partiality or as some people have said it, unfeigned. Dissimulation kind of gives us, it's kind of like all these words, unfeigned, meaning not fake, not hypocritical, not with partiality. You say, what is partiality? Liking one person over another. You know what God says in the context of the family of God is that our love ought to be a genuine love that's from God. And when it's from God, that love is going to be without hypocrisy, it's not going to be, the word feign, it means literally play acting something. That love is not just going to be an act. You know, I've, if we're not careful within the husband and wife relationship, love can turn into an act. What does that mean? It means it's a routine. Well, I got to tell her I love her. Why? So that she knows, so that she'll think that I love her. No, we shouldn't be putting on an act. We shouldn't be feigning something. It ought to be genuine and it ought uh, to be real. And the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. The next thing it says, abhor that which is evil. Interesting, this word abhor is used only one time in the whole Bible. Actually, there in, in this chapter, Romans chapter 12, there's actually a handful of words that are only used one time in the Greek New Testament. And this is where they're used. And you know what the Bible says? Abhor that which is evil. You say, well, of course, we're, supposed to hate. we're not supposed to like things. We're supposed to dislike things that are evil. Can I tell you that while we may not participate in things that are evil, if we're not careful, the devil would like us to tolerate things that are evil. You say, what is tolerate? Well, I'm not going to do it, but, you know, they can, they can go ahead and do whatever they want to. Uh, that's okay. Now, the Bible says that we're supposed to abhor. It means that we're supposed to extremely hate that which is evil. Notice it says that which is evil. It doesn't say people. We're supposed to love the sinner. We're supposed to hate the sin. The devil would like us to have compassion on that which is evil. Now, again, we're supposed to have compassion on sinners. But having compassion on sinners is Sometimes us telling the sinner that what they're doing is sin and what they're doing is evil and what they're doing is destroying them. And I wouldn't love you in a way that doesn't have hypocrisy. And I wouldn't abhor that which is evil if I couldn't call it out into the life of somebody that I love. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we're just every time we see something wrong in someone's life. Well, God's called on me to hate it, uh, to hate the sin and love the sinner. And so my way of loving the sinner is is always calling out every little sin that I see in everybody's uh, life. But can I tell you, in the context, again, of the local church, which is the context of what we're talking about, we're supposed to abhor that which is evil. What does it mean? It means I'm supposed to love my brother or my sister in the Lord enough that when I see something that is dangerous, something that is hurtful, something that uh, that the devil would rather me just tolerate or have compassion or show some kind of understanding. No, the word abhor, it means to dislike, to abhor, uh, to have a, uh, a horror of. What does it mean? It means we're supposed to hate evil. We're supposed to hate it in our life. I believe we're supposed to hate it in the life of others. We're supposed to hate sin, love the sinner. We're not supposed to tolerate it and i'm afraid too many times even in my own life when i should hate evil i say well it's not so bad or here's another here's another phrase i think the devil likes to get us to use well that's not my go ahead and hand that to mama that's not my business can i tell you cain tried to pull that on god am i my brother's keeper no, what Cain was saying is, taking care of my brother isn't my business, that's his business. Love inside the family of God, inside the context of 
exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to hate evil. I'm going to hate it in my life. I'm going to hate it in the life of others. I'm going to hate it in the sin-cursed world. I'm going to abhor it. The next thing, I love how God gives us often something positive, then something negative, then right again, something positive. Cleave to that which is good. That word cleave, it literally means to hold on to something that is good. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The Bible says, if any, and, and, and what does that mean? He that is joined to the Lord or to cleave to that which is good. Literally, it means something that is inseparable. I know you probably heard this illustration before, but imagine it with me, if you will, in your mind's eye, a plastic pepper shaker and a plastic salt shaker. Two very different things. But if we were to take some really strong super glue and epoxy and we were to bring these the salt and pepper shaker together, it would save a lot of time because then you could shake salt and pepper on right away. Yeah. Anyways, but imagine with me how you got you got this picture in your mind, salt and pepper shaker, and they're super glued together. What does that mean? They've cleaved together. What happens when you take these things apart? You can't. Why? Because they cleave together. They are fused together. One has become part of the other. And when you separate them, you have broken pieces. Can I tell you that the Christian, we are admonished in Romans chapter 12 to cleave to that which is good. What does that mean? It means, oh, you ought to try doing something good every once in a while. No, no. It means goodness ought to be something that's just like evil is something that repulses and we try to push it out of our life. Goodness ought to be something that we want to incorporate into our life in such a way that it's an inseparable part of our life. It's something that can't be washed out. If you will, our life is stained with that which is good. Again, 1 Corinthians, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He goes on and he says, cleave to that which is good. He gives us another positive. He says, be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love. Again, this be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love is a phrase that's really, it's used one time in the whole Bible. This word uh, kindly affectioned, it means the mutual love of parents and children and wives and husbands. I understand it's talking about there is a love and a familiarity among a family. A love and a familiarity among a family. You know, I go and uh, uh, you, we, we've all experienced this. How long has it been, Brother Tagafi, since you've seen your son? If you had to piece together the years. Uh, good, two, years now. two years. But I imagine if you walk through the door, What's the first thing you'd try to do? Probably give him a hug. If you saw your son, Mrs. Degoffi, if, if David Lyons walked through the door, said, surprise, it's May Day or May 31st, I'm coming in, what would you do? You'd go give him a hug. You wouldn't say, you know, uh, where you been for the last couple of years? You, uh, you know, and understand that familiarity, that love, that acceptance, like, like I just saw you a couple of moments ago, but at the same time, that feeling of, I haven't seen you in forever. That's the kind of love that God is talking about that he wants his people to have in the context of the family of God. The, the, the idea that I haven't seen you in forever or the idea that it was just like yesterday that we've seen each other, that closeness. And that's what he calls brotherly love. Can I tell you something else that I've learned through experience about brotherly love? Well, let me help you out. Something that I've learned about brothers. Whenever a brother has another brother, invariably what, what happens is that these brothers fight. I, I've never known two brothers that said, you know, I've never fought with my brother. There's some girls I've heard that. I don't believe it. Uh, sisters that said I never fought. But, you know, brothers, I've learned. But you know what brothers do? Brothers learn to get over that. They learn that, you know what? He's still my brother. And on the flip side, sisters learn when they get into little spats and into little conflicts. You know what? She's still my sister. And moms and dads, as much as they 
at, at times it is very appropriate and it is very right for them to separate themselves from their children for their children's own good or for their own good. And I tell you, that's not a permanent thing that any parent wants. What does the parent want to do? You remember the, the prodigal uh, son's father? Every day he woke up and he walked out there and he was looking for his son to come back. You say, what's brotherly love? Brotherly love is the person who is the person within the family of God who is yearning and longing for the day when that lost sheep comes back. The father, the prodigal son's father, demonstrated that kindly affection one toward another with brotherly love way more than the, the prodigal's brother did. Notice the next thing the Bible says. Be kindly affection one to another and brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. That word honor, it means this, showing value of something. Can I ask you a question? Do you consider yourself more valuable than somebody else? Something I've had to consider in the, uh, you know, in the last while is, you know, it is certain things are important. Certain things are imperative in your personal life. But at the same time, do I place more value in my needs than I do in the needs of my family and the needs of my wife and the needs of the people that God has called me to serve? Honor means showing value. And sometimes showing value for one thing means you have to devalue something else. What does that mean? It means I have to say, you know what? In order for this to have value, this other thing has to decrease in value. In honor, again, the question is, are, is my life more important? And then he uses that word preferring. That word preferring, it literally means to go before and show the way, to go beforehand, to go before as a leader. If I could say this, like a mother or a father prefers their children. We think of prefer as like to like something more than another thing. That's what honoring is. Prefer literally means to go before and to prepare a way for that thing that's very valuable. Just like as a parent, before we let our children, you know, we have a baby. when We, ha we don't have a baby now, but when we had babies, what would we do before we let them loose into a room all by themselves? We would prefer that room means we would go into that room. We would make sure that there's nothing that's going to hurt the baby, nothing that the baby's going to be able to get a hold of, nothing that uh, is going to endanger that baby's life. We would prefer, we would go before them and make sure that everything was safe and everything was healthy. And when the Bible says that, in that we ought to honor or show value to other people and prefer them, it literally has that idea of showing value and going for and preparing away for them. The next part, I love this part. It says, uh, not slothful in business. As one, uh, one pastor said, what is your business? Are you minding it? Are you diligent? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Proverbs 13, verse 4, the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. I love how in Proverbs 13, it doesn't say the life or it doesn't say the body of it. It says the soul of the sluggard desires, desireth and hath nothing. Do you realize that when we are lazy, it is not just a, it's not just a body problem. It is a spiritual problem. He says, not slothful in business. Proverbs 21, verse 5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteous. Again, we got to get it in our heart. We got to get it in our mind that it is not a, laziness is not a body thing. Laziness is a heart and a spirit thing. Proverbs 22, verse 29, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. That word mean men, it doesn't mean like, we think it means, it means he's not going to be in that average crowd. God's going to put him before kings and rulers and professionals in their way. Proverbs 27, verse 23, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and, work, and look well to thy herds. 
The Bible simply says it in those couple words, not slothful in business. What is your business? Is your business, you know, if you get a job, can I tell you that as a Christian and within the, the again, within the context of the local New Testament church, we ought to not be slothful. One thing as a pastor I have to balance is I get so busy in doing this thing and doing this thing and doing this thing. You know, part of not being slothful in business is realizing that there are certain things that you can't take on because they, they, what do they do? They take, they make you so that you can't be diligent, not slothful in business. Love the next thing the Bible says, fervent in spirit. That word fervent or that phrase, fervent in spirit, it literally means like you're, you're boiling over or you're bubbling over. You ever been uh, making preserves in a pot and then uh, you're stirring it, stirring it, stirring it, stirring it, and then what happens? It begins to boil, it begins to boil, and then it begins to come over the top. And you know what? You can turn that heat down. You can try fanning it, and what happens? It just starts boiling over the top. When the Bible says fervent in spirit, it literally means that. It means that there ought to be an enthusiasm about the things of God. When it says that word spirit, it says they which worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? It means there should be some excitement about serving the Lord, fervent in spirit. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, we're given a picture of this. The Bible says, And the child grew, talking about Jesus, and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. When it says he waxed strong in spirit, it's the same idea as being fervent in spirit. Luke chapter 10 and verse 21, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit. What does that mean? It means he got excited about being excited and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And John, again, verse 24, verse 23, like we said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. You know what God's looking for? You ever been over a children's activity and you have a line full of children ready to be picked for a game? We're picking teams. Who do you pick? The one that's just kind of sitting there. Or you pick the one. Pick me! Pick me! Who do you think gets picked first most of the time? You know what? God's saying be fervent in spirit. Get excited. I literally believe that he's saying that God wants to work through people who are excited about being used by him. Be fervent in spirit. Notice this. Serving the Lord. Real simple. Who do we serve? You know, if we're not careful, we can confuse serving ourselves with serving the Lord because we can say, I'm doing this for the Lord when we're really doing it for ourselves. Serving the Lord. Why do you do what you do? Did you come to church to serve the Lord this morning to be in fellowship with his people? Or did you come to church because you didn't, people would ask why you weren't here if you didn't come to church? You heard about the, the man it was a Sunday morning. Oh, I gave the whole joke away. Never mind. The, the man who said, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church. And his wife says, you have to go to church. And I said, I don't want to go to the church. Nobody's nice to me and everybody hates me. And his wife said, you have to go to church. You're the pastor. <laughs> you go to church because you have to go to church. Or you go to church because you get to go to church. Because you get to serve the Lord. The Bible says, serving the Lord. Again, what it means here is it, it means why we do what we do is very important as what we're doing. Rejoicing in hope. Ask a, a simple diagnostic question. What makes you rejoice? You know, we tend to love and rejoice over things that we have. You know, our children, they love to take whatever that new thing that they found or built 
or acquired in whatever way they acquired. And what do they do? They like to show it off. They like to rejoice. You know what the Bible says that our rejoicing ought to be? But, or, uh, how, put it like this. If our rejoicing needs to be in hope, that means a confident expectation of the things that God is going to deliver, what is our rejoicing not in? Our rejoicing is not in the things of this world, but it's in the things of this world to come. You know what happens? We get so focused on the things of this world and rejoicing and all that we talk about, all that we boast about is what's going on out in the world rather than what's going on in the hearts of people and what's going on in the kingdom of God and how God is working. Again, when we heard this, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't always express myself the best way, but when I heard about Jacob and things starting to go right in his life and making good decisions, and then as I saw throughout the week hearing about some things where he got opposition and he stood up for the Lord. It was exciting. I rejoiced. I rejoiced that God is going to deliver on his promises. Patient in tribulation. That word patient in tribulation, as one person put it, endurance when things get shaken up. You know, it's real easy to get patient, to be patient on a beach with a nice cold drink in some tropical place, right? It's real easy to be patient there. And when you can just snap your fingers or, or uh, call and get room service, I, I bet most of us could be pretty patient in that situation, huh? Because everything's just easy. But you know what the Bible says that we're supposed to be patient in tribulation? What does that mean? It means when everything's going wrong, that's when God wants us to demonstrate our patient. Does that patience. Does that mean we should be impatient when everything's going right? No. But his emphasis here is that we're supposed to be patient in tribulation, enduring calmly with the grace of God when everything is falling apart. i just be honest with you. When everything's falling apart is not generally when I am the most patient or it's easy for me to be patient. But that's what God calls upon me to do. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That word instant and continuing in the New Testament, that word instant is a little different. We think about instant like this right away. But in the New Testament, when you see the word instant, it means something that takes hold and continues to take hold. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, all these continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. That word instant, the word continued, the same. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And four verses later it says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That word continuing in prayer means just exactly that. It means we don't stop. You know, that's what, that's what continuing means. It means don't stop or don't end steadfastly. It means a constant discipline of continuing to pray. You know what we as humans, and maybe it's just me, but we tend to do. We tend to pray when there's tribulation, but when everything's going okay, we're not as consistent maybe in our prayer life. The Bible says continuing instant. What does it mean? Staying at it. Stead, fast, continuing. Distributing to the needs of the saints. What does it mean? Finding a pathway to take what God has given me to be a blessing to another. Can I tell you, I, I, I sometimes brag, I don't, I don't want to, but I brag on Grace Baptist Church in that they, if they exemplify one thing, meeting the needs of the saints within the church, meeting people's needs, meeting the needs of missionaries and pastors as they come through. You know, one thing I'm thankful for is that on behalf of Grace Baptist Church, 
we get to meet the needs. I like to look sometimes, you know, as a pastor, I meddle. Uh, when you ask a missionary or you ask a missionary's wife, is there anything you need? A lot of times they lie to you because missionaries are just liars. You, they don't want to tell you what they really need. You know how you find out what a missionary needs or what their wife needs or what the children need? Just ask the children because children haven't learned how to lie yet. And you ask me, is there anything you need? You know, we do. We need this or that. And sometimes it's not always a need, but you get it anyways. And sometimes, most of the time though, children, they have a good heart and they're not, they're not gold digging. They're just, they're just honest about it. You know, distributing to the, to the needs of the saints. We don't always have it within our power to grant everybody's desires, but meeting their needs. Given to hospitality. That ancient Greek word for hospitality is, is literally translated a love for strangers. Given is a, is a word. How, is that, how do I explain the word given? You can be hospitable to somebody because you're made to be. Or you can be the, what the Bible says, given to hospitality. It means it's just, it's just a natural outpouring of the working of the Holy Spirit of God into your life, in your life. Are we given to hospitality or do we begrudgingly show it up again? I tell you, even hospitable people can have times where it's challenging to be hospitable. The person who you've been so hospitable to that they take it for granted and so they think that the hospitality is always there. The door is always open. You said that. The door is always open. And so I just decided to show up at whatever time it was. Are we given to hospitality? Do we go after people that we don't know and try to show them the love of God? Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. And we're going to spend some time next week with some other weighty actions that he tells us to do. Some more. He, the end of Romans chapter 12, he gets very specific in how we're supposed to live as a Christian. And can I tell you, being a Christian is not a wimpy thing. It takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of power. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed. No one looking around. Has God spoken into your heart about one of these things? Is there something where you say, it would be sin for me not to respond to what God has spoken into my heart today? If you're like that, you say, there's something God spoke to me about and I need to talk to him. I need to get it right. I need to make a plan. If that's you this morning, I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that this morning? You say, God spoke to me about something. I want to Speak to him about it. I want to make a plan. I want to get it right. Fathers, some have raised their hands, and I know in a message like this, uh, we touched on a lot of points, and I pray as we open this up to an invitation that you would work in the hearts of the people of God. But if you pricked our heart about something that is in this list that we are not doing, that you would help us to take positive steps of obedience toward you. Bless in this invitation, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.